Okay, so we can move to the next part. So we have seen in the first part uh, the parametry of a wave. Now we are going to, to, to increase the physical dimension of the information. And we are going to move to the scattering parametry, or what we could say also uh, uh, the pixel parametry in the case of a fully parametric system. Yeah. So if we come back to the to the first architecture I have presented to you, so this one it was a, a, the first hardware system of a dual parametric system. So you can see. Uh, so now you understand why I have written a drone vector. So this kind of a system is a dual pole system, dual parametric system. So it provides to the user the drone vector information. So for each pixel, I have the complex value, the output of my two receiving antennas, the output of the horizontal antenna, the output of the vertical antenna. It is each time two complex numbers, magnitude and size. And this is the drone vectors. So in such a case, we can apply what I have presented to you before the break about the wave parameter. Now I'm going to change my system to create a fully parametric system. So remember, the key point here is to introduce the switch. So like, <coughs> like that, I can switch from a horizontal transmission to a vertical transmission, horizontal, vertical, etc., etc. So each time, I'm going to measure two jump vectors. So the first jump vectors, which is which correspond to the transmission of a horizontal wave. And the second joint vector, which correspond to the transmission of a vertical wave. And I'm going to concatenate these two vectors to create a matrix. And this matrix is what we call a scattering matrix, or what we call also a Sinclair matrix. Sinclair is the name of, uh, of the scientist who derived uh, the first part of this, uh, of this theory. So, scattering matrix. So, all the tools I'm going to present to you, you now, all the, all the concepts, will be uh, around the scattering parametric, will be about the scattering parametric. And so first of all, I'm going to introduce different ways to describe this information. Okay, so this is what we call the target parametric descriptors. So target, uh, target, it is a theoretical uh, name, but uh, you can replace target by pixel. Okay, so the different uh, pixel parametric description. So there exist uh, five different descriptors. So the Sinclair matrix, what I have just introduced to you. The target vector, so we shall see how to construct this target vector from the Sinclair matrix. The Keno matrix, which was used mainly by uh, Heinen and the coherency matrix and the covariance matrix. So today, today, we are using a lot the coherency matrix. And uh, I shall show to you why it's better to use the coherency matrix uh, instead of the other descriptors. Okay, so let's start with the scattering matrix. So the scattering matrix is the output of the system. So when you, you are going to hold a, Different parametric uh, SAR images to, uh, to a space adjacency, you will receive the information of the scattering matrix. Okay, the information of the scattering matrix. So you have to remember that uh, we are in the monostatic case. So monostatic case means that the transmitter and the receiver are exactly at the same place. So this is why, in such a case, the reciprocity theorem is can be applied so it means that the hg equal vh hg equal vh so the two elements here are equals so to summarize if i'm going to receive a, a fully parametric star image if i take one pixel one pixel of the star image from uh, this uh, four star images i receive I can construct for one pixel the corresponding scattering matrix, which is here. The first question 
we can ask is what is the parametric dimension of the pixel? You know that uh, in physics, we have something which is very important, is the physical dimension of the event. It's impossible to create dimension. It's impossible to reduce dimension. So you have each time to take care of the physical dimension of your information. So we need to know what is the physical dimension of a pixel, of a parametric pixel. So we have to know how many independent parameters we can use to describe perfectly the pixel. Okay, so I repeat, the pixel is described by this scattering matrix. Okay, so this scattering matrix, in fact, we have a one, two, and three complex coefficients. So each complex coefficient has a magnitude and a phase. So it means that we have three magnitude and we have three phases. We can say that uh, the physical dimension is equal to six. Okay, so a pixel can be described by six independent parameters. But remember that uh, during the definition of the polarization, I have introduced the phase, the absolute phase, which exists okay, from the physical point of view. Uh, it's a phase, it exists, but it is impossible to measure. It is a random value. So in fact, this absolute phase is included inside the three coefficients. So what we are going to do, we are going to take out the absolute phase because it means nothing. So in conclusion, we shall have six minus one equal five independent parameters to perfectly describe the pixel. So in conclusion, the parametric dimension of a scatter of a pixel will be equal to five. Okay, so to summarize what I said is here. So this is for a given pixel, this is a scattering matrix with the one, two, three magnitude, the one, two, three phases, okay? So I have six independent parameters. So I'm going to take out the absolute backscattering matrix phase. So I'm going to take this phase out. So in conclusion, I shall have one, two, three, four, five independent parameters. So this is one number you have to remember because we shall play with this number with a decomposition theorem. So in conclusion, parametry is not difficult. You have just to remember five, okay? Parametry is equal to five, okay? So just remember. Okay, so this is a first descriptors. So we have already seen some examples. So if I come back to my San Francisco area, so we have the free information. I can have at the output of my fully parametric system, the HH channel, HG, and VV channel. We have seen that it is possible to combine these three channels on a color image and to create uh, this uh, Sinclair color coding with the HH on the blue channel, HG on the green channel, and VV on the red channel. Okay. And what is important is what we have seen just before the break. So remember, I have introduced, I have introduced to you some uh, transformation using some matrix. And so like that, we can reconstruct the SAR image or the information in another parametric basis. This is what I conclude just before the break. It's very easy to create a horizontal and vertical antenna. But imagine tomorrow that I would like to have an idea of what could be the scattering if I measure this environment using an elliptical polarization. I'm not going to change my antenna, impossible. I'm not going to go to the satellite to change the antenna. I'm just going to receive the information. I'm going to apply what 
Lumber described, and what I have presented to you, the elliptical transformation, okay, which is represented here with the three matrices, the three matrices. So like that, I can move from one given basis to another basis. And I shall apply what we call a com similarity transformation, which is given here. So what does it mean? It means that uh, for each pixel, for each pixel, I take uh, the scattering matrix corresponding to the image I have received on the horizontal and vertical basis. This is the output of my radar system. And then from a signal processing point of view, I'm going to multiply by the corresponding elliptical basis transformation matrix. And the result will be the new pixel, the new pixel, in a new parametric basis. Okay? So like that, I can reconstruct all what I want. And I can do this only, only, if at the beginning, I have the fully parametric information. Okay, so some example. So this is a classical false color poly star image of my area, which is measured directly with the antenna on board, the horizontal and vertical antenna. So this is what I receive. Okay. So this is a poly combination. And then I'm going to apply a basic transformation to reconstruct what happened if I could transmit a 45 degrees polarization and receive in a 45 plus 45 and minus 45 orthogonal polarization basis. And I get this image. So you can see that uh, we have some change of colors. If I have some change of colors, it means that I have some change in the scattering mechanism because the result will not be the same if the environment is eliminated by a horizontal or vertical wave or eliminated by a 45 or minus 45 polarization. So you see the result. I don't change the antenna. Okay, I don't change the system. I just apply a signal processing. And uh, the next example to illustrate this power of a basis transformation is this image, where you can get the image in a circular basis. So I imagine you would like to see what happens if my environment is eliminated with a circular polarization. I can do that using this uh, signal transformation only, without changing anything uh, inside the hardware of my system. I'm not going to change the position of my antenna. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, so before answering to the question, me, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Can you explain to me why the sea, the sea, the ocean, appear now in a green color, in a green color. Why the sea is green? Okay, it's not a question of uh, algae. It's a question of polarization. So you have to think some minutes about this problem. So remember, I start from this uh, acquisition. The ocean is blue. Okay, no problem. And now, if I apply a basis transformation in the circular basis, or if I transmit a circular polarization wave, the result will be a, a C with a green color. Why? Okay, so the question is what does it say about a point Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so to answer to, to, to this question. So as I explained when I introduced at the beginning of this uh, reciprocity theorem, um, the reciprocity theorem uh, is valid only in a quiet environment. For example, if I'm going to make a measurement in an equate chamber on a target, uh, this reciprocity theorem holds, no problem. Now, as I explained, 
during the acquisition, my sound system is going to move a little bit. So remember that uh, I'm going to transmit a horizontal wave. <laughs> and then I'm moving. And then I shall transmit a vertical wave. I'm moving and transmit a horizontal, and then vertical. So for sure, when I'm going to transmit a horizontal, and when I'm going to transmit vertical, I am not exactly at the same position. So I'm not going to see the environment exactly with the same configuration. But I'm very close. I'm very close. So this is why, if I look into the details, HV is not equal to VH. Something which, which is very interesting is if you make the difference, if you take the difference between HV and VH, you can have a, an information about the noise of your radar system. Okay. We shall see later on when I shall derive the Hagen values. If I keep uh, the four coefficient, HV and VH, differently, the fourth Hagen value will be exactly related to the noise flow of the system. And so you can correct, you can correct your information by subtracting this uh, noise information so you can clean a little bit your data. Okay? But usually, usually, it's not a, a very important error if I make a, the average between HV and VH to create HV plus VH divided by two, and so like that, HV equal VH, okay? So usually this is what we do. Uh, in a polinsar, in polinsar, we prefer to keep uh, HV different to VH because uh, this phase information, this uh, difference in the phase information can improve, can improve the reconstruction of the topography or can improve the reconstruction of some uh, a biophysical parameters. Okay, so it depends on the application. Okay, so I have a lot of HH minus VV. Okay, C single bond, so it changed unless. Yeah, great. This is a solution. Okay. So what does it mean? So it is a like a wall. Okay, it is a, a, it's a phase. So if I take a circular position, imagine I take a left circular, due to the scattering mechanism, it will be a right circular, which is coming back to the radar. So it means that I have a complete depolarization. I transmit left and receive right. Depolarization. So it means that all the information will be contained in the LR channel in the LR channel, so in the green channel. Well, this is the reason why the C is green, because it reflects the information of the depolarization. Okay? Okay, so this is all what we could say about the scattering matrix. Okay, so remember, we can use the scattering matrix to make some basic transformation. But, but, but something you have to be, you have to take care. It's completely forbidden, 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 forbidden to average scattering matrices. Completely forbidden. For example, we shall see later if I want to apply a speckle filter. If I want to apply a Spatial averaging. It is completely forbidden, forbidden to average scattering matrices. Why? Remember what I explained to you at the beginning. Inside this coefficient of the scattering matrix, I have this absolute phase, the absolute phase, which is the random phase. Okay. And I don't know this phase, but I know that uh, this phase is contained inside, inside the pixel, inside the scattering matrix. 
So from one pixel to another pixel, even if it is in the neighborhood, from one pixel to another one, the absolute phase is random. It is completely different. So for sure, if I'm going to average all this information, the results will reach zero very rapidly. Okay, so remember, it's forbidden, completely forbidden, to apply any statistics, to apply any data averaging using the scattering metric. And so this is why we are going to introduce other descriptors, which will be independent of the absolute phase. And from this, it will be possible to apply this uh, data averaging. Okay? So it is very important point, forbidden, completely forbidden to average scattering matrices. Okay, so the next descriptor is a Taylor matrix. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, descriptor. It was a descriptor which was used by uh, Heinen, uh, as I explained to you. So this is Heinen. So this is the construction of this uh, matrix. So this matrix, uh, the Kino matrix, is constructed from the scattering matrix. And uh, the, the idea, the originality of Heinen is that he was able to introduce these parameters. Okay, E not B not C D E F G H etc. etc. And uh, thanks to different uh, experimentation, he was able to provide a physical interpretation of uh, each of these parameters. So at that time, in the 70s, in the 70s we did not have a SAR space bound system. We had a ground radar system, military ground radar system. And the idea was to detect the target and was to recognize the target or to identify what kind of target we have. And so, in fact, it was the beginning of the deep learning. It was the beginning of the artificial intelligence to recognize something from data. So he has created a very important library of different canonical targets with the different corresponding parameters. And these canonical targets were measured in the adequate chamber. And he was able to, as I said, to, to give a physical interpretation of uh, all these parameters. And this is a list of uh, physical uh, interpretation. So I'm not going to, 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 to present uh, this to you, but just for your, for your information. That uh, the target generators, or the island generators, or what we call the island generators, are coming from uh, this, uh, this uh, theory. And uh, his uh, thesis was about uh, phenomenological theory of radar targets. So, he, as I explained at the beginning, he was not able to derive the equation, the electromagnetic equation, but he was able to make uh, experiments, to make measurements, and to give a phenomenological interpretation of, uh, of the scattering mechanism. Alors, so, antenna frame of reference, uh, I guess, in the internet from my eyes, unless you just said no. No, because uh, usually, usually, and this is uh, the, the, the problem of the definition of, uh, uh, of uh, the scattering, uh, we take, we take uh, only uh, one reference frame, which is a frame of the Transmit antenna. Okay, transmit antenna. So for sure, if you change the reference frame not to the antenna but to the wave, the handness will be the same because it will be left and it will be left in the local reference frame. But, but, to be able to make a comparison, we take uh, the reference frame of the transmit antenna, which is identical to the reference frame of the receiving antenna, and not the reference frame of the wave. Okay? So this is why left is different to right. 
that is something uh, which is uh, very, uh, very important. Okay, so if we continue the different uh, descriptor, uh, this is the Keno matrix and the Heinen, uh, Heinen uh, generators. Okay, so the next descriptor is the following. So we are going to start with the target vector. So what does it mean? It means that uh, I don't like to work with a scattering matrix. I don't like to work with a matrix. Usually we prefer to, to, uh, to work with vectors. From an electromagnetic theory, it's more easy to handle vectors and to handle the matrices. So we are going to start from the scattering matrix because this is what we are going to receive uh, at the output of the, of the radar system. And we are going to create a corresponding uh, scattering vector. So it's very easy. And we have uh, two ways to do this uh, kind of uh, creation of the vector. We are going each time to project this matrix on a orthogonal group of matrices. And there exist two different orthogonal matrices groups. So lexicographic group and the Pauli group. Okay, so the starting point is the matrix, the input is the matrix, the output is a vector. Okay. So as I said, there exist different different matrices group. So the first one is the Pauli. So what we are going to do, we are going to create the K vector, the target vector from the vectorization of the scattering matrix using using the set of the Pauli matrices which are expressed here. And the result will be the following. This is the target vector, which has four different components in the B static case. The first component is equal to HH plus VD, and remember this corresponds to single bound. The second component is equal to HH minus ZV. And remember, it corresponds to double bonds. The third component is equal to HV plus VH. And the last component is equal to HV minus VH. So if I keep this vector, I can uh, come back to one of the previous questions. The last parameter here, the last component, can provide to me the information about the noise. The noise during the measurements. But in conclusion, this target vector is more close to the physical properties of the scatterer because this is what I explained to you. The first one corresponds to single bounds. The second one corresponds to double bounds. And the third one corresponds to volume scattering mechanism. OK? So this is the advantage of uh, using this uh, group of uh, orthogonal matrices using the Pauli matrices group because the output will provide to you a vector which is close to the physical properties of the scatterer. Okay. As I said, there exists a second group, which is what we call the lexicographic matrix group. And in fact, the output will be very simple. It will be the four components of the scattering matrix, which are expressed in the form of a vector. So usually, as a remote sensor, we prefer to use the previous one, the, the Pauli target vector. But if I am an engineer, if I want to, to work on the radar system or on the hardware of the radar system, usually we prefer to use this uh, vector because we are more close to the system measurables. Okay. So this is what we call the lexicographic target vector. So you can use uh, one of the two. Uh, well, we prefer to use uh, the previous one because we are more close to the physics. Okay. So we have two vectors, the poly and the lexicographic. Here it is in the B-static case. In the monostatic case, remember, HV equals V, 
pH. So this vector reduces to a three dimension vector, which are expressed uh, here, the K vector and the omega vector. Okay, so this is what we are going to use. But remember, even if I'm going to introduce vectors to represent the information included inside the pixel, it is still forbidden to average these vectors because you can see that these vectors are directly the copy of the coefficient of the scattering matrix. So these target vectors are still a function of the absolute phase, which is a random value. So it is still forbidden to make any data averaging on the target vector. Okay. Just a way to represent the information using a vector representation. And something which is very important is that we can move from one vector to another vector using a, a unitary transformation, which is given here. So I can the input can be the the omega vector and the output can be the k vector, or the contrary, the input can be the k vector and the output can be the omega vector. And I can move from one representation to another representation using this transformation. And this transformation is uh, what we call a, a unitary transformation. So it means that it's going to preserve all the information, it's going to preserve the norm of the vector, it's going to preserve the phase inside the, the components of the vector. Okay, so this is why I can move from one to another one. And now I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to introduce the coherency matrix. And then I shall introduce the coherence matrix. So what is the coherency matrix? In fact, the starting point is the target vector. Okay. And I'm going to create this coherency matrix from the outer product of the target vector. The outer product is given here. It is a K vector multiplied by K transpose conjugate. Okay. And this matrix, the result, will be a matrix three by three. And which is very important is that due to the definition and due to the conjugation I have in the definition of this matrix, the product will make the phase, the absolute phase, disappearing. So it means that uh, this coherency matrix will be independent of the absolute phase, will be independent of this random phase. So the conclusion now, I can average the coherency matrices. Now, I can apply a speckle filter on the coherency matrices because I am independent of the absolute phase. So this is why we are going to process each time from a parametric point of view, this matrix, this matrix. Okay. So just to summarize, I'm going to receive my free parametric star image. For each pixel, I have the scattering matrix. For each pixel, it's forbidden to make any data averaging because I have the absolute phase. From the scattering matrix, I'm going to construct the target vector. On the target vector, I'm going to construct the coherency matrix. So it means for each pixel, I shall have a corresponding coherency matrix. And then, I shall be able to average these coherency matrices to get some statistics, to get some filtering, to get uh, whatever efficiency after. So this is a very important step. What is also important is that uh, I have written here this coherency matrix versus the high net parameters. So if I want, I can also provide some physical interpretation of the components of this matrix. According to the physical interpretation, Heinen provides to us. And something which is very important are the three elements of the diagonals. These three elements, so T11, T22, and T33, are what we call Heinen target generators. 
And these three elements, in fact, correspond or have a physical interpretation I have already introduced to you before. The first T11 element corresponds, in fact, to HH plus ZV. So, in fact, in the T11 element, in the first one here, I have the information of the single bond scattering mechanism. In the T22 element, in this one, I have the information of the double bond scattering mechanism. And in the last one, in the T33 element, I have the information of the HV elements, so the depolarization information. So in fact, this is exactly what we do when we receive a, a SAR image, a fully parametric SAR image, without any a priori information. The first step is from the SAR image, the original fully parametric SAR image. Immediately, I construct the corresponding coherency matrix for each pixel, and immediately I extract the three elements of the diagonals, and from the three elements of the diagonals, I can construct the false color poly sort image. Okay. So this is my first flow chart, very easy flow chart. And this is what we shall do uh, this afternoon. So just to summarize, this is already what I explained to you. We can demonstrate that uh, in the case of a surface, HH plus VV will have a, a very high value. So it means that the T11 is very close to a raw surface to single bond scattering mechanism. T22, HH minus VV, is related to double bond scattering mechanism. And the last one, T33, is related to volume scattering mechanism or random scattering mechanism. Okay, and it is from these three elements of the diagonal that I can construct, so this is uh, the elements which are represented here, I can construct the corresponding false color image. Okay. And something which is also very important is that I can also apply an elliptical basis transformation because you have seen that uh, from the capture matrix S, we have seen previously that it was possible to apply a basis transformation using this uh, special unitary group. Okay, so this matrix, these matrices are used for the scattering matrix. And there exists a one to one correspondence. There is a bijection. There exists a one to one correspondence in the case of the coherency matrix, which are given here. So this is a corresponding orientation matrix, ellipticity matrix, and a phase matrix in the case of the coherency matrix. So in conclusion, I can also apply, I can also apply any kind of elliptical basis transformation as we did previously. Okay, so I have presented to you before the consumery transformation when the input is a scattering matrix and the output is a scattering matrix. And here it will be the same when the input is a coherency matrix and the output is a coherency matrix. And I apply also this kind of a transformation. So this is why this is very, very, very useful. To and the last descriptor is another kind of matrix. It is a covariance matrix. Okay, so we have seen that the coherency matrix is derived from the K target vector. So from a logical point of view, the covariance matrix will be derived from the second target vector, the omega vector. Okay, and so this is the definition of the covariance matrix. And I'm going to apply also a hotter product I'm going to use also the conjugate of this vector. So by definition and by construction, all the elements of this covariance matrix will be independent of this absolute phase. So I can average all these covariance matrices. I can make any speaker filtering. I can make any statistics because I shall be independent of this random scattering. You mean C decompose circular signal, but not the linear signal. What means decompose for you? Uh, 
Uh, I think uh, uh, more or less I can do some. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, you have to make some electromagnetic field theory. <laughs> um, when you have a linear polarization, okay, linear polarization, on the interaction, of the continuity of the vector, you have an opposite phase and uh, the wave is coming back. When you have a circular polarization, by definition, this uh, circular pro transmitting L and receiving R. Ah, okay, if you, if you see, uh, yeah, okay. When you transmit less circular, in fact, to, uh, to have an estimation of the scattering mechanism, Circular, remember, is a combination of uh, horizontal plus vertical with a phase difference of 90 degrees. So this is what you are going to do. You are going to, to look after what happened with the horizontal component. So you derive uh, the, the result. What happened with the vertical component? So derive, you derive the result. And then you combine, again, these two components to create the polarization of the of the reflected wave. And in uh, when you have, uh, from a canonical point of view, when you have a left circular position, you can demonstrate that the scattered wave will be a right circular position. So you transmit L and you receive right. Yeah. In the case of the C surface or in the case of the Rau surface. In the case, in the general case of a single bounce scattering mechanism. Okay, I transmit left on the wall, I receive right. Okay, so if I continue the presentation of my covariance matrix, so okay, so it is in the B static case and in the most no static case, I can reduce to a three by three dimension because remember HV equals VH. Okay. So here also, here also. I can uh, introduce the elliptical basis transformation. So here also, I can use the same matrix to reconstruct the covalence matrix in another elliptical basis. Okay. So it is exactly like uh, the covalence matrix I can do with, uh, with the covalence matrix. The significant difference are explained here before. In fact, everything is starting from the target vector. Okay, the coherency matrix, coherency matrix, T matrix, is constructed from this information. The covariance matrix is constructed from this information. Okay. The information contained in the K vector is related to the physics. The information contained to, in the omega vector is related to the system, to the hardware. So the coherency matrix, which is constructed from this vector, is more close to the physics. I can give a physical interpretation to the elements of the covariance matrix. With the covariance matrix, it will be more difficult to give a physical interpretation. But if I want to make some measurements of my uh, system, for example, if I want to make some power budget uh, estimation of the system, I prefer to use this information of the omega vector. Okay, so it depends on the application. So this is the main difference between the two matrices. I can, uh, with the coherency matrix, immediately I can give a physical interpretation. Okay. Because remember, the coherency matrix, I have a physical interpretation for each of these elements. It is Heinen who provide to us this uh, interpretation. Okay, and uh, the coherence matrix,
Okay, I have this information, and this information is very difficult. For example, today, today, I don't know what means, what means. From a physical point of view, this uh, parameter, I just conclude that uh, it corresponds to the correlation, to the correlation between HH and V. Okay, this is a correlation. But uh, what does it mean from a physical point of view? If I go back to the currency matrix, I shall use HH plus ZV, and I shall use HH minus ZV. So here I have already a physical interpretation. Okay? So if I want to extract, for example, the sigma of the HH and the from the covalence matrix, are they were respectively key? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So C11, okay, it is this element. And this element is a modulus square, or the square modulus, sorry, of the HH channel. And from the square modulus, you get the sigma nut information. Okay, so C11 is a sigma nut HH, and C33 is a sigma nut VV, and C22 is a sigma nut HV. Okay? Okay, so this is what I said. I can make. Uh... Okay, so to summarize, in fact, uh, with this slide, uh, I can answer also to one of the previous questions. Uh, what you have to remember is that uh, the starting point is the same. The starting point is a scattering matrix. I can extract in one pixel. So the starting point. Information is a scattering matrix, so I'm not going to create information. I'm not going to uh, to lose information. I'm just going to rewrite my information. Okay. So I have two ways to uh, to describe my information using the coherence matrix or using the covalence matrix. But it's not a problem because I can go from one representation to another representation using this uh, transformation matrix we have seen just before. Okay, so this proves that I'm not going to lose the information. Okay, I'm just going to rewrite the information. What is important also is that uh, these two matrices have exactly the same eigenvalues. And remember that the eigenvalues uh, correspond to the hertz, hertz of the matrix. Okay. It's from the eigenvalues that uh, you construct everything. So as I have explained here, yeah, both matrices contain the same information. Okay, exactly the same information, but they are not represented in the same way. So this is why we prefer to use the T matrix, the currency matrix, because I am more close to the physical and geometrical properties of the scattering process. So for me, it's more easy to provide a very simple scattering uh, interpretation or physical interpretation. And But if I want to derive or to construct my weather system, in such a case, I shall use more the covalence matrix, the C matrix, because I am more close to the system with the robot. Okay. Well, so just to summarize, that I can go from one, one representation to another representation. I can go from the simpler matrix to the covalence matrix via the target vector. I can go to the simpler matrix to the covalence matrix via the omega vector. Or I can go to the scattering matrix, to the Kelo matrix via this Kronecker product. So, really speaking, C for calibration. Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is a, a nice, uh, a nice summarize of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what I say. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's more easy to calibrate, to calibrate a radar system using the the covalence matrix, because like that, I can calibrate exactly the, the HH channel, uh, the VV channel. I can calibrate the imbalance between the two channels. I can calibrate the phase difference between the, the, the two co-pole channels and the cross-pole channels. Okay. So uh, it's a good summary. C can be used for calibration, and T uh, can be used for, uh, for uh, remote sensing and analysis, physical interpretation of uh, of the scattering mechanism. Yeah, you're right. 
Okay, so I can move from uh, one implantation to another one. And uh, for each of them, for each of them, remember that uh, I can introduce this uh, very important point uh, concerning the, the basis of summation. So uh, working in a, or measuring in a physical basis and uh, uh, transforming in another in another basis. No, you, you no, you, you you can you, you can use covariance matrix to make a data averaging or statistical test. No problem, no problem. You you, you can do it. Uh, you can do also uh, using covariance matrix because uh, we have seen that uh, we can go from uh, one matrix to another matrix. Okay. And what is very important, what is very important is that uh, the transformation between the C matrix and the T matrix is what we call a unitary transformation. So due to the fact that it is a unitary transformation, all the statistical tests you are going to do on the covariance matrix will be exactly the same on the covariance matrix because you can do everything and you can move from one descriptor to another descriptor so if you derive a, a data distribution using the, the covariance parameter if you use the coherency parameters it will be exactly exactly the same data distribution okay. if you do uh, if you find a, a gaussian distribution it will be a gaussian distribution if you find a Richard distribution, it will be a Richard distribution because I have a unitary transformation between the two matrices, between the two descriptors. Paul Sapo does everything. Yes, yes, for sure, by definition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in Paul Sapo, you can process both. You can process uh, coherency, you can process covariance matrices. Up to you. Okay, so and so to summarize, to, to conclude uh, this part, uh, I just here yeah, represent again, represent again uh, the different uh, parametric uh, transformation uh, matrices. Okay, I can use to go from one basis to another basis if, if I apply on a scattering matrix, coherence matrix, or coherence matrix. Okay. Um, if I want to calibrate, if I want to calibrate, usually this is what we do uh, because we prefer to to calibrate independently each channel. Uh, because uh, with the coherence matrix, you have seen that the T11 parameter, for example, is HH plus B. So it can, if I want to calibrate uh, HH plus UV, it means that I'm going to calibrate uh, the combination HH plus UV. Usually, we prefer to start from an uh, initial point to calibrate separately, first of all, each channel. I'm going to calibrate HH. I'm going to calibrate DV. I'm going to calibrate HVC from a magnitude point of view. Then. I'm going to calibrate, in fact, the phase difference between all the channels. So this is why it's better to use, in such a case, the coherence matrix. The output of the, the calibration would be coherence matrix, if you want. But after you can move and you can come back to the, to the coherence matrix to give a physical interpretation, because you have the transformation. Okay. You have this transformation to go from coherence to coherency or coherency to coherence. Okay. I'm just going to see. 
Okay, so the train to two. Just have a look to my slide. Okay, so maybe I shall come back a little bit uh, on the theoretical part uh, before the practical, because I would like to show you something before you are going to do the practical. So we shall continue a little bit uh, after lunch. Okay, so if we continue, next step. So, uh, which is maybe the most important slide of uh, my lecture. It's a very beautiful slide, right? Okay. And you have the number five, number five. So remember that a five is a most important parametric parameter. So this is why we call this a parametric a golden number, okay? Because it corresponds to the parametric target dimension. So remember that uh, we are going to, to, to make some data processing on uh, our SAR images. We are going to apply some speckle filter. We are going to apply some decomposition, some classification, whatever. So remember to check after each process if you keep the same physical dimension inside your pixel. Because if at the input of my uh, signal processing, I have a real physical dimension equal to five, and at the output of my process, I have a physical dimension equal to whatever, seven, six, nine, ten. It means that I change something in the physics. So it's not good. It's not good at all. I have not the right to, to increase the number of uh, physical dimension. I have not the right to decrease the physical dimension. I have to keep the same value. And what is the value? It is five. Because we are still that the pixel can be described by five independent parameters. So you have to keep in mind each time I must have five independent parameters. Okay, so remember that uh, my five degrees of freedom are coming from the three amplitude of the coefficient of the scattering matrix and the two relative phase between the element of the scattering matrix, five independent parameters, five degrees of freedom. The target dimension is equal to, okay. But I have just presented to you new descriptors of the same information. I have presented to you the Keno matrix, the coherency matrix, the covariance matrix, etc. If you remember the coherency matrix, the T matrix, I have expressed the T matrix using the nine INN parameters, which are here. A node, B node, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Or if I use the covariance matrix, I have described the covariance matrix with all the combination between H, H, and V, and D. And I have also nine parameters. Conclusion. The input of my descriptors is a pixel with a physical dimension equal to five. The descriptor create has a dimension equal to nine. So there is something which is not uh, good. It means that uh, the nine parameters of the output of my descriptor are not independent. They are not independent. So they are linked together with nine minus five equal four. So it means that there exist four equations which link the nine parameters together. So like that, if I find these equations, I shall have at the output five independent parameters. So how to find this equation? I'm not going too much into the detail from a mathematical point of view, but uh, we have to know that uh, the coherency matrix, like the T matrix or the C matrix, the coherence matrix, it is the same. By construction, it is what we call a Hermitian matrix. Hermitian matrix. Hermitian matrix means that the invert matrix is equal to the matrix transpose conjugate. It is a mathematical property. 
But what is also very interesting is that uh, this matrix is, from a mathematical point of view, is what we call a rank one. Rank one. It means that the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero. Rank one. And what is also important is that uh, the nine principal binaries are equal to zero. Nine, why nine? Because it is a three by three matrix. Three by three equals zero. What is a minor? A minor is a determinant of a sub matrix. So I have a three by three matrix. All the sub matrices I can extract are two by two matrices. Means that uh, I can construct this first two by two matrix. I can construct uh, this two by two matrix. I can construct these two by two matrix. I can construct these two by two matrix, etc., etc., etc. In fact, I can construct nine sub matrices. And a minor is a determinant of a sub matrix. So if I take, for example, the first one, so if I take this first submatrix, and if I calculate the determinant of this submatrix, it would be 2 in naught multiplied by B naught plus B minus C plus G die multiplied by C minus G die. And the result will be up in this equation. I can do the same with another submatrix, and I can get another equation. So it is like that that I can create the nine equations which link all my nine parameters together. And so like that, uh, I come back on my foot. Okay, so I still have five degrees of freedom which are constructed from nine dependent parameters, but with four related equations. So among uh, these nine equations, I'm just going to select four, four of them only. And usually it is uh, this uh, equation we, we choose. Can be another equation, it's not a problem, just to remember that uh, these nine independent parameters, uh, these nine parameters are not independent, but are related together with the four uh, target equations. So in conclusion, my descriptor, my descriptor, will still have five degrees of freedom. So still have a physical dimension equal to. It is just, just to, to, to remember this. Okay, so in conclusion, what we have seen this morning, I have presented to you some uh, basic definition of the polarization state. Then I have presented to you different descriptors of the information, the different matrices. And in fact, uh, what we are going to do now, we are going to, to see what we can do with this kind of uh, matrices, or what kind of information I can, uh, I can introduce, what kind of uh, information I can uh, I can uh, average uh, which kind of information I can uh, use for physical parameters extraction, etc., etc. Et so we can uh, slowly introduce some concept of uh, remote sensing. So if you have no question, I'll continue a little bit before the lunch break. And to start uh, the last part of the lecture about advanced concept, and uh, we shall. Uh, Continue a little bit this afternoon, and we shall conclude tomorrow morning. So about parametric remote sensing. Okay, so this is a next line, and this is what I'm going to propose to you to to, to have a look. Usually, when uh, we receive some uh, fully parametric SAR images, usually uh, we propose a very basic qualitative analysis. Qualitative analysis of uh, the information of our SAR images. The first step usually is what we call a speckle filtering. 
for some chassis. Uh, shall I just make a very small introduction about the spec of detail, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you know what it means. So we, we apply this, uh, this uh, speckle filter in this parametric speckle filter, parametric speckle filter. To clean, to clean a little bit uh, the data, to have a better interpretation of uh, the information. Then the second step is uh, very, very important. It is what we call a, a parametric target decomposition. It's very important because it is a, a philosophy. Philosophy, which is behind the philosophy. And you know that uh, sometimes the science uh, reach philosophy. So this is a very uh, philosophical concept, uh, what we call the, the target decomposition. So we shall focus on this part. And uh, by the end, the, 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 the last step can be a classification, a segmentation, supervised or unsupervised, whatever. Just, just to have a an idea of uh, of the results you can get. Just to have an idea of how uh, uh, the different pixels contain the same uh, the same information. Okay, so this is what I propose to uh, to, um, to to see, uh, and uh, we shall start uh, with speckle filtering, then the decomposition, and uh, with the classification. Okay, so first step: speckle filtering. So just an introduction. Just an introduction because we can uh, stay uh, one week uh, working on the speckle filtering because uh, somewhere sometimes it's difficult sometimes uh, sometimes it can be easy it depends but uh, the speckle filtering uh, we have not yet found the right solution concerning the parametric speckle filter okay so you know you know uh, what is a speckle for so speckle is this kind of uh, of granular noise which appear on the, on the image. This noise is coming from the fact that uh, the radar system is coherent. Coherent, it means that it's going to measure some complex information, amplitude and phase. And the combination of the phase is going to create uh, this kind of uh, salt and paper uh, uh, colors. Sometimes uh, the phase are constructive, Sometimes the phase are destructive. So this is just uh, due to this uh, coherent uh, uh, information the radar is going to, uh, to measure. So the problem is that uh, we, have, uh, we, can, we can lose some information. We can have uh, not a very good interpretation of the information. So we must clean, we must clean this information. Okay, so this is what I explained to you. The bright point corresponds to constructive interference, and dark point corresponds to destructive interference. So this is uh, this is what we call the salt and pepper phenomenon. But what is very important is that uh, on a target, on a corner reflector, for example, usually we have no speckle. We have no speckle because uh, the reflected power is so high that even if I have a small amount of noise, in fact, it is negligible compared to the power of the scattering due to the to, to this uh, target. So usually for a target, we have no speckle. But for natural, we have speckle by definition. But we are not sensitive to the speckle because it is negligible uh, versus the power reflected. But on our on natural environment, on forests, fields, etc., we are very affected by the speckle. Okay, so the conclusion of what I said is that uh, if I want to develop a speckle filter, my speckle filter must be intelligent. What does it mean? It means that uh, in an area, in an homogeneous area, like for example here on the sea surface, homogeneous area, where I know that the speckle is very important, where I know that uh, my interpretation can be disturbed by the speaker. In fact, my filter must reduce a lot the effect of this noise. And if I am on a heterogeneous area, for example, uh, in a urban area, where I know that I have a lot of targets, which are the buildings, here my filter must 
keep intact the information. Must not filter. Because I know that in this area, the speckle is not too, uh, too important. So what does it mean? It means that uh, during the speckle victory, I have to make an estimation if it is a homogeneous area or if it is not a homogeneous area, if it is a heterogeneous area. If it is a homogeneous area, I have to reduce the speckle because the most important is the radiometry. But in an heterogeneous area, I have not to speckle, to filter for me. Sorry, because I have to preserve the details, because I have to keep intact the spatial resolution. So in the literature, there exists a lot of uh, classical speckle filter. You have the medium filter, the map, the right of Naga, or sigma, first geometric of morphology, etc. But these filters usually are uh, applied on uh, intensity, amplitude, um, or apply mainly on single parametric channel. So they are not parametric speckle filter. So we have to develop a specific parametric speckle filter, which must take into account all the parametric information and the parametric information between the channels. And this speckle filter must preserve this parametric information. Okay, so this is why it is a totally a new approach of the derivation of the speckle filter. Okay, so this is some uh, example. So you have the, you have the original image, you have the median, you have the bus car, so you can see that it is not very good. This kind of uh, speckle filter is not very good. They are good in the homogeneous area because uh, I can uh, uh, minimize the effect of the, of the noise. But in a heterogeneous area here, you can see that I have completely lost my resolution. And here is one of the most important uh, filters, which is uh, developed by John Sunny, which is a Lee refined filter, which uh, keeps the resolution, so which is able to detect if uh, I'm going to, uh, to filter homogeneous area or not. Okay, so if I want to develop a, a speckle filter, a parametric speckle filter, I have to keep in mind that I have to preserve the parametric properties, the parametric properties between the different channels. If as the input of the speckle filter, I have a single band capture mechanism, as the output of the speckle filter, it must be again a single band capture mechanism. Okay, I have not to transform this capture mechanism in a double band. So I have to keep the parametric properties. Okay, and so this is uh, the graph of the of the Lee speckle filter. Uh, so without going too much into the details, so the input will be a coherency matrices, because remember that uh, I'm going to average my parametric information. So if I'm going to average the parametric information, I have to average to average information which is independent of this absolute phase. So this is why I'm going to average the coherency matrix. So as the input, it will be the coherency matrix. As the output, it will be a coherency matrix, okay? And you can see here yeah, it is uh, the speckle filter. So the input is a coherency matrix. I average some coherency matrix. I weight with the coefficient, and the output is a coherency matrix. And you see this coefficient is defined by this relation, and it is this coefficient which provides to you the information if it is a homogeneous area or if it is an inhomogeneous area or heterogeneous area. So if it is a homogeneous area, k equals zero, so in fact the output will be a simple coherency matrix averaging. If it is a heterogeneous area, k will equal to one. So in fact, the output coherency matrix will be equal to the input coherency matrix. I don't apply any filter. Okay, I keep the resolution. I keep perfectly the information.
Okay, so I have uh, two questions. So resolution is low, yes, for sure. Okay, you are going to decrease your resolution because you are going to average uh, the coherency metric. Okay, so you are going to decrease uh, the resolution. Uh, to remove parametric information, no, because my uh, my uh, starting point, okay, this is what I said before. This is one of the most important constraints. I have to preserve my parametric properties, so I'm not going to to lose my parametric information. Okay, uh, for sure. If you are going to average 100 pixel over 100 pixel, you are going to mix a lot of different cache mechanisms. So for sure, the output will be completely different compared to the input. Yes, but if you apply a classical speckle filter with a 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7 window, you keep the neighborhood, so you are not going to lose too much parametric information. Does the V-filter conserve the phase? The phase, yes. Yes. Because, so this is, this is why it is important, because I'm not going to play with the phase, I'm, I'm going to play with relative phase. Relative phase, it is a phase between elements, between elements. Okay, so I keep the relative phase. My coherency matrix here is independent by construction of this absolute phase, which is a random phase. Okay, so I don't care of it. It's finished. You have no more absolute phase. But I keep, I keep, I try to preserve the relative phase because relative phase is parametry, and parametry is information. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Good question. It is always the same question. Okay, so I have different questions. So you apply the filter to every TEG? Yes. If we look to this information, after to this equation, okay, it is exactly the same in the equation for each element of the coherency matrix. Okay, so I apply exactly the same amount, the same amount of filtering, same amount of filtering on each element of the coherency matrix. Okay, so like that, like that, I preserve the relative information between the Okay. How do you determine the maximum size of filtering box area? <laughs> okay, good question. Well, uh, we have shown by uh, with uh, Carlos Lopez, which I'll show you a picture uh, just after. We have shown that uh, we have found a good compromise. We have quite a good estimation of the properties of the speckle. When we are close to uh, 50, 50 looks, 50 looks. So 50 looks is equivalent to uh, 7 by 7, 7 by 7. Okay. Usually, uh, 7 by 7 is a good compromise for a window. So for sure, if it is an open area of open field, 7 by 7, it's okay. If you are in the border between urban area and open field, yes, seven by seven in the border, in the limit, in the boundary, in the boundary, you are going to mix, for sure, by definition, you are going to mix uh, uh, different catch free mechanisms. Okay. So seven by seven is quite a good compromise. Yes. 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 Okay, so in mangrove, for sure, you are going to mix the trees and the water. Uh, in you are in a full area of uh, trees, it will be on the trees. In a full area of water, it will be on the uh, water. On the boundary, uh, uh, for sure, you are going to you are going to uh, to mix uh, different capturing mechanisms. So the idea. The idea can be to to play with uh, this coefficient k, okay? So this coefficient k defines more or less uh, the kind of area, if it is heterogeneous or homogeneous area. And this coefficient k, this coefficient k, uh, I have not given it here. Yes, it's given here somewhere. Okay, it is function of uh, 
the variance is function of the variance of the information. The variance of the information is function of the multi look of the images. Well, the number of look is the input parameters of this speaker system. So even if you're going to process a single look, when you're going to launch the speaker filter, you can change, you can change the number of look artificially, you can change the number of looks. So like that, like that, you are going to change the dynamic of the coefficient too. So you are going to change the limit of the homogeneous area versus inhomogeneous area. Okay, so you can play, you can play with this uh, indirectly with this coefficient of uh, multi look. Tac, 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 Uh, yes. Where does the, take, the term box score come from the speaker filter? Okay. Ah, in China. Okay. She found the advice. Good. Box car. Box car or box car. The name is uh, the other name is a sliding window. Sliding. Sliding window. It is just a window. You move over the image. If it is a three by three window, you take the nine pixels, you take the nine coherency matrix, and you have the you have the range of this nine coherency matrix. Okay, it is a three by three sliding window, and we call this box car. Okay, so it's not maybe the first name of uh, of this filter. Uh, I, uh, I just replaced the question <laughs> the box in the side. Okay, would you apply filtering if you search for smooth? No. Ah, okay, so each time it is a compromise. Okay, each time, uh, so I, I try to answer to the question about uh, small maritime targets. Uh, this is a problem. Uh, I know this because I talked for some time, I had uh, some projects about. But this is a, this is a problem. A problem because uh, usually your uh, maritime target is located only in one pixel, and the surrounding uh, the surrounding uh, for sure uh, has a lot of speckle on the sea surface. Has a lot of speckle, so usually uh, up uh, we apply a very basic speckle filter, but uh, we are going to lose uh, the pixel which contains uh, the target. But if you don't uh, apply uh, a speckle filter, you will have a lot of false alarm, for sure, in your procedure. So it must be a compromise. Maybe you can use a free by free and to see what happens in your case. Or you can use, uh, I'm not going to uh, to show here because uh, I was obliged to, to limit uh, my presentation. What I have done, I have done a kind of sub-aperture of aperture, it is, uh, I take the SAR image and I coop in several uh, parts, uh, the spectrum of the SAR image. And so like that, uh, you can see what the radar has seen during the acquisition. So if there is a target, the target will be present uh, each time, whatever, 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 the sub aperture. But the sea surface is moving, whatever the sub aperture. So like that, uh, it can improve, it can be used to improve the target detection. But it is, uh, yeah, each time it is always the same, uh, same problem. <laughs> it's always a, a question of compromise. Uh, up, 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 uh, for what you say, you can use top right. Ah, okay, top right filter, okay, I understand. But, but, you're right, you're right. Uh, top right filter is okay if you, if you are going to process time series. But here I am in the case, so I'm going to process only one, one, one side, one side. Okay. So the idea is uh, very well known, 
uh, I'm going to make a stack, my time series, my time series, and my speaker filter, instead of uh, applying a spatial domain, I'm going to apply in the time domain. Yes, so like that, I'm not going to reduce my spatial resolution. But here, but here it is just in the case of a one, one star image. Okay, a pole star image, not a pole time star, but just a pole star image. Okay, one, one image. So like that, we are obliged, we are obliged to, uh, to apply on, on the special, special dimension. Uh, because with a bigger window size, we also do some object recognition. Uh, uh, uh. Yes, yes, you can do that. You can do that. If you do that, this is equivalent to uh, to do what we call a multi-scale, multi-scale approach. If you uh, if you apply some uh, wavelet wavelet signal processing, this is indirectly what you are going to do. You are going to uh, more or less to decrease the resolution, so it is equivalent to increase the size of the window, and uh, like that uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can have uh, uh, a change of, uh, of the output of the speaker filter according to the size of the window. Yep. Yeah. And the last one, statistical assessment of again vector based target decomposition, so I mean, what are polarity? Good. A good one. So I'm just going to finish a five slide, no, just to show some results. Okay, and then we stop here. Okay, just to show to you the result of the box scale, so you can see it's not good. It's good on the surface because homogeneous area. It's not good at all. In a heterogeneous area, because I have completely lost my spatial resolution. Okay, so this is the first speckle filter which was proposed by Jensen, uh, so in 1999, so first parametric star speckle filter. Okay, so you can see that it is okay on the, uh, on the sea surface, it is quite okay on the urban area. Then uh, we work with uh, Jensen to introduce some physical aspect during the process. So it means uh, that uh, we, 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 we extract only the pixel which correspond to a single bond, only the pixel which correspond to double bonds, only the pixel which correspond to volume scattering, and we apply different speckle filters according to the scattering mechanism, and then we will combine everything. Okay, so we are a little bit better in the, in the urban area, and uh, we preserve also some kind of texture in the homogeneous area. So this is quite a good filter also. And the last one was proposed by Janssen uh, quite uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so he start again with uh, an old, old uh, speaker filter. He, he developed some before, it was a Sigma filter. So here he's using two, uh, two windows, one window for homogeneous area, one window for heterogeneous area. And he combines the two windows uh, to improve uh, the, the effect of the, of the speaker filter. So as I said at the beginning of this part, today we have not yet found, found the perfect, the ideal speaker filter. Okay? We have not yet found it. So it is still an open door for research. So we have people which continue to work on this topic. And today we are using the Lee filter because uh, we can say that it is a good compromise. It is a good compromise because we have a good reduction of the speaker. We preserve the details. We, we keep the parametric information. And uh, we have a computational efficiency. And it is not at all difficult for confirming the, the implementation. So this is why we, we use this uh, filter today. And why? Why we don't uh, yet find the right filter? It is only because we don't know exactly the data distribution, the data distribution concerning the, the parametric information. For example, we know that uh, in the HH and VV or HV channel, in the magnitude channel, we know that uh, this uh, speaker is a multiplicative noise. Okay, this is demonstrated. 
but on the off diagonal terms, for example, in the correlation between VV and HH. We don't know exactly what kind of noise it is. It is a mix between additive noise and multiplicative noise. So this is why we have not yet perfectly described the statistic of this speckle or this noise in this channel. And uh, only one guy, so Carlos, Carlos Lopez Martinez from, uh, from uh, UPC, uh, University uh, Polytechnique in Catalonia, in Barcelona. So did his PhD on this topic. And he succeeded to, to introduce a, a model which is a mix between a multiplicative term and an additive term. Okay, so we continue to work on that. So this is why it is a very, very important point from a, from a research point of view and from a parametric point of view that we have to continue to work on this topic. Okay, and so that's conclude this part, okay, it was some example. So let's conclude this part uh, about the speaker filter.